let's have a vision that our ministry to children and young people is biblical, is relational, is prayerful, is in partnership with parents, and we see people coming to faith and being baptized. Yeah. So, so if that's our starting point for what's our vision, we then just work back from there to say, what would it look like if we did it? Welcome to Independence, the FIEC podcast. My name is Adrian Reynolds. I'm the head of National Ministries, and I'm here today with Ed Drew. Hello, Ed. Hello, it's great Thanks to be here. so much for joining us. We're not in your normal habitat. Nor yours, London. Adrian. No, we're in Keswick. Yeah. Just tell us briefly what we're doing in Keswick. Uh, there is a conference happening for about 100 people uh, on the topic of identity, and I think it's probably not a secret to say, thinking particularly about sexuality and gender. Yeah. yeah both understanding the issues, but I think it's striking that I think most people are here because they want to know how to talk to people about it. Right, okay. Now, I'm going to ask you in a moment why you're here. I'll tell you why I'm here. I'm here because I'm very interested in the subject. I want to be thinking about um, how do I approach this clearly, theologically, pastorally, but I'm also thinking about it with an FIEC hat on, you know, there'll be different views in the FIEC. How do we manage that and think about it and serve our, our breadth of churches? So that's why I've come. Mm. It's very cold. It's actually cold in this room, but um, we've we've got the warmth of fellowship. <laughs> Was it Nelson who was once offered a? Um, this is the kind of historical insight you get on the um, on the FIC podcast. Uh, Nelson was once allegedly, um, apocryphally, um, offered a cloak um, it, when he was being rowed in a boat, and he said, "I need no cloak to keep me warm. The warmth of England stirs my heart, or something." So there we are. Okay, good. Um, so yeah. Uh, now, why are you? Why have you come? You work for Faith in Kids. Yeah. Just tell us what Faith in Kids is. Uh, Faith in Kids is an organisation that is trying to support and encourage parents okay. and help churches to thrive by raising children together who trust Jesus Christ. Brilliant. That's a great strap line and a great mission. Mm. And tell us why you've come to this. Uh, I've been asked to run a seminar at the end of the conference. So if you, we've started off with like the background to this issue and the theology and we're yeah. going to finish. I signed up for it, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We're finishing by doing some practical seminars and I've been asked practically how we're going to talk to children and young people about the issues of gender and sexuality mm. and how we're going to do that well. Um, is there, is a, we're not talking about that today as it happens, but immediately people who are watching or listening mm. will be thinking, oh boy, that's a massive subject. Mm. I want, I'd like to get my head in, in around that and be thinking about it. Are there some go-to places at the moment where people could be thinking about that? Or is that part of the problem that actually there aren't many resources? No, I think there are. I, I personally would love to say before we go to a resource, I don't think the issue amongst the FIC church leadership is that they don't know what they think on the issue. I think that's fair. I think the issue is is we're nervous about having conversations. Right. So I'm not going to fall for your trap of giving you (laughs) another book to read. I'm glad about that because if you saw the pile of unread books in my office, you would despair probably. I, I, I would love to say to church leaders, please can you encourage parents that they can talk to their children about these issues without fear. And they can do that because they can ask their children questions. If their kids are growing up in your FIC churches, they've heard, they've heard something on this. Yeah, sure. If parents were asking their children good questions, that would be a massive win. Thank you. Um, now let's park that to one side. What I really wanted to talk to you today about and just basically bend your ear a little bit and get some wisdom from you is about how we as church leaders, it's a a podcast for church leaders, I'm a church leader myself, how do we encourage those in our churches who are working with young people? Mm. So this isn't about parenting per se, this is about the the children's and youth work that goes on in our churches, very faithful, very fruitful often. Mm. So we had had four baptisms last year, um, all children inside the church who had Mm. grown up inside the church. And um, uh, someone had said something to me along the lines of, oh, wasn't it a shame we didn't have any outsiders Mm. who were converted? I thought, what a a sad thing to say. You know, here are four young people who have been converted to Christ wonderfully through a combination of wonderful teaching at home, um, through the faithful ministry of, of children's workers and youth leaders in the church, and also supremely by the Holy Spirit that's how they've been converted but isn't that something to rejoice in and and to be pleased about but but I I wonder actually if if for many of our youth leaders children's workers it just feels like a grind 
feels like really hard work. Yeah. I, I, I'm not, I think I'm probably not untypical. I'm in a church of 120 people. Mm. If we were all there, mm. which we rarely are, if we were all there, all our children's and youth work mm. is done by volunteers. Mm. I guess that's not untypical, is it? That's absolutely the norm. Yeah. And, so, and we need know, to just start by saying You look that. at these big flagships yeah. where, you know, masses of teams and what have you, that's not normal, is no. it? No. I mean, look, the biggest, wealthiest church might be employing two people, maybe three yeah. for zero to 18s. Yeah. Uh, so there is, it's a, it's a rare church where the biggest ministry, the biggest number of people serving in ministry, Bible ministry isn't kids and youth work. Right. So, so help me out here. I'm, I'm a leader in a local church. I really want to encourage those who are working with our kids and young people. I want to affirm them and mm. honour them. Mm. I think that's something we don't talk about very much. Mm. I want to train them yep. and help them get trained. I don't want to overburden them yep. and um, place upon them an expectation they simply can't manage. They've mm. often got busy lives, mm. maybe families themselves, busy jobs. So help me out a little bit here. How can I, as a church leader, what would you want to say to me mm. as as Adrian, elder of Christchurch Harborough, yeah. in terms of how I really invest in, encourage, help mm. those who are working with children and young people? Uh, the first thing I want to say is it can't all be on the church leader. It, it could be spread over the elders, but that the healthiest churches who are doing this, I see one or two elders having a particular responsibility okay. and it not usually being the church leader who take a particular care for those in this ministry. So, so probably we come to this conversation with a degree of guilt and tiredness. I don't know many church leaders who have a huge amount of time where they're looking for something to do. No, I, I don't know any. No, exactly. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so therefore, let's start by saying, I'm not about to give you a laundry list of extra yeah, things yeah, to do. Okay. Let's, whatever we're about to do, let's make this achievable. So I, I would start by saying, uh, as an eldership, let's have a vision for what our kids and youth work is doing. Right. So the first thing is, is our teams will never have a bigger vision than ours. So if we have a vision for what is happening, for how the Lord can use this ministry of our prayer for this ministry, pass that on. Because that immediately says there's value and we believe the spirit is at work in miraculous ways through our ministry. Yeah. Don't we all want that for any ministry? Yeah. I think the next thing I'd say is never recruit by asking for volunteers on the stage. Okay. <laughs> Uh, a, it doesn't work, and B, it devalues everyone. We would never recruit for our small group leaders. We would never recruit for our preaching. Uh, we would never recruit from the stage. Can anyone just step up who for any Bible opening ministry? Okay. So don't so don't do that. The person who puts their hand up is is the person who is either bored or I, don't, I, don't, I mean there might be. A, I've had one person ever walk up to me and say, "I'd like to serve in children's and youth ministry." I would say I've sat and had coffees with over a hundred people saying, please, will you start? And I've had people saying, I won't have a coffee with you because well, I know what you want to ask me. So let's talk about that because that's recruitment's really important, mm. isn't it? And um, in fact, we've just changed um, a leadership of our Sunday school and our, um, and our youth work in church, probably for the first time in many, many years, probably long overdue. Mm. And um, we, ha we, I'm sorry, we did do a little bit of that. I have yep. to conf I'm confessing my sins. Okay. Um, I hope there'll be forgiveness from you. Yep. Um, so we did do a little bit of that. And I think it's because we feel this is the point in church life yep. where we feel most stretched. Okay. And I, I, I just... But I tell you, I, so, so tell me a little bit more about how in an ideal world, yeah. if we were doing it again, yeah. right? How, how should recruitment work? I mean, first I want to ask you how many stepped forward as a result of you saying from the stage, can anyone help us with kids and youth work? Um, so the people we needed did step forward. Okay. How, yeah. So what, how many? Two well, or three, we, four, we need, five? Well, we needed someone new to head up okay. children's ministry and have someone new to head up youth ministry. And you got two leaders of ministry by asking yes. from the front. Yeah. Well, I mean, I honestly well, found that amazing. Well, we're, we're a reasonably small church. Okay. So asking from the front was <laughs> right. saying to the church, okay. this is a need. Okay. It's time for the two people to step down. Okay. We need to be praying about this as a church. Okay. We need to be asking the Lord to raise up people and maybe it's you. Okay. So that it was framed in that kind of, okay. let's work this through as a church together. It sounds very positive. Okay. So that's how we did it. Yeah. 
It was a whole. It was. It was meant to be a whole church discussion. It okay. wasn't just anybody free next Sunday. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think. Uh, I think particularly when we're talking about leaders of ministry, which I think because of the nature of ratios, which is for over eights, you have a ratio of about one to eight, and with under threes, you have a ratio of about one to three. Yeah, yeah. So because of ratios, you're going to have a lot of people involved in children's and youth work. Yeah. And especially because you don't want them doing it every single week. I'm not going to agree with that, Adrian. Okay. So uh, I think the goal, I think the goal in our church is everyone is able to say, my ministry is and fill in a gap. Right. I think that's a reasonable goal. We come to church, we're a member of a small group, and we each have a ministry that we can name. So there are very good practical reasons why we don't want the same person doing kids' work every week on a Sunday. But I think there could be some in our churches who are gifted for it. Yeah. There are yeah. some in our churches who are very good at helping children to understand God's glory. And so I want to set them free to do it. And I want to find ways to enable them to do it really well. And there's one story I heard of a, a church where they made the radical decision to say, we're going to do one term on, two terms off. Right. Okay. So for a whole term, the same team was in charge of the fours and fives. And... In the second week of the next term, after they'd done the whole term, two of the leaders came up to the person in charge of the ministry and said, how are our children doing? <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. the lady telling me the story of her church said that's when she knew they'd made a right decision. Those two were missing their children. Yeah. They wanted to know how were they getting on. They had a, they, they had a church. Mm. That they, they were partnering with parents to pastor a group of children. They missed them. And the reality is, is until we spend three consecutive Sundays with a group of children, we actually, it's a struggle to really feel yeah. like we're getting yeah. it. Now, I want to be clear. What I'm not saying is everyone in our churches should serve every week in children's and youth ministry or anything like that. I'm just saying, let, let's have a vision that our ministry to children and young people is biblical, is relational, is prayerful, is in partnership with parents, and we see people coming to faith and being baptized. Yeah. So, so if that's our starting point for what's our vision, we then just work back from there to say, what would it look like if we did it? So for instance, if team leaders as a starting point were, we knew who they were, they knew who they were, we were praying for them, they, we were interviewing them in church, we were finding out, how, we were finding out what the big needs were. Yeah. So I, I think that that's a great starting point. I think before I go to training, or I, I would just say um, it's, it's quite a rare group of people who work with children and young people who have sat around a table and been thanked and been encouraged mm. and prayed with them. So I, I would say as a starting point, can you invite them around someone's table, give them a lasagna and say, what are you giving thanks for in this ministry and what are you praying for? I phrase it like that because if you say what's going well and what's broken, it becomes quite a long and yeah, painful yeah, conversation. Yeah, yeah. So if we just get one of each from each person and we listen, for most churches, that, that would be a radical encouragement. So that kind of is a positive affirmation, really, yeah. of what people are doing. It's acknowledging it is a ministry, it's not childcare. Yeah, yeah. It does sometimes feel, doesn't it? I, I'm not now speaking about our church, I hope, but it does sometimes feel as though it's kind of filling in the gaps, children's ministry in some yeah. churches. You know, we know we've got to do it. Yeah. And, and it is a bit of a burden. So let's just get some people to do it. And yeah. It does and feel a bit like that sometimes. Yeah, and thanks for being honest. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for being honest and saying that. And I'm, I remember, I remember the, um, the, I had one particular woman who was the wife of an elder. She would have been in her late 50s who would regularly come up and tell me how Crash was going. Right. Particularly how the mums were in creche, yeah. sometimes the dads. And it got to the point where she said, I found two other women. We'd like to alternate one of us on every week in creche to care for the parents in the room. Mm. So I had three older women, super godly mature Christians, whose children had long grown up, who were putting themselves back in creche because they saw that at this season of life, 
the parents in crash are mostly broken, tired, mm. and wondering, why do I even bother coming to church? Yeah, yeah. So to have someone mature and godly just talking to them, praying with them at the end, I just thought, I, th I thought that was amazing. Mm. The godliness of those three women. And that's helpful, isn't it? Because I think in, in the crash, especially if the parents have come in, it's more obvious at that point that this is a partnership between the church yeah. and families. Yeah. Um, I, I liked how you were describing children's work and youth work yeah. in the same way. Yeah. I think to some people that looks a bit more like child care. Yeah. But actually reframing it in terms of, you no, know, this is a partnership between the church and the parents helping the parents, serving yeah. the parents yeah. as they raise their kids, reframing it that way yeah. is, is actually quite beautiful. And, and it stops just being a job at that point. It, it becomes a ministry, doesn't it? Look, uh, look, I work for Faith in Kids. The, the statistics are half of the UK church say they came to faith under the age of 11, three quarters say by the age of 18. So the stats say, and I'd argue the Bible says, the normal way into God's family is through growing up in a Christian home and growing up in a church. So... I also want to be clear, my crash is mostly screaming. <laughs> our kids' ministry is snotty kids who say they're often bored. And our youth ministry is, but there's no one quite like me and I've got no friends. So please don't- No one like you and you've got no friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, first of all, let's just be clear. Children's and youth ministry is rarely glorious. Yeah. You rarely get kids putting up their hands saying, honestly, please, can we have more of your divine wisdom? Mm -hmm. Open your Bible yeah. and let's go. So however you're doing it, it's probably going to look hard grind, full of discouragement and a touch of despair and wonder why we're doing it. Mm. The Bible tells us this is how people come to faith. This is the normal way people come to faith. So it doesn't have to be the only thing our churches do. It doesn't have to be the thing we put most effort into. But we have to treat it as ministry. We have to. We have to be saying this is where the supernatural is happening. That's. I'm excited by that all over again. Um, I love working with kids, and I'm excited by it all over again. Just help me out a little bit here. A lot of churches in the FIC are smaller, mm. and will feel that um, they just don't have critical mass. Yeah. In kids' work or yeah. youth work. Yeah. And maybe you're. You're. I don't know. You're. Um, let's say you're you're 11 to 14. Yeah, yeah. You've got three. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe you've got four, yeah. but they don't get on. Okay. So how, how can we encourage leaders when it feels okay. like the day of small things? Okay. Um, there's some, there's something yeah. to do there, isn't there? Brilliant. There is. Leaders? There is. Yeah. Let, yeah. Let's just first of all be clear. You just have a very different problem where you have a massive youth group. Right. Where you have a massive youth group, the problem you've got is how do we ever make them part of the church family? How do we avoid them dropping off at the end aged 18 when they've never truly okay. been part Which of the church? Which is my story, by the way. I was converted age 12 from yeah. a non-Christian family okay. and went along to a BU church yeah. in the South End where I grew up, yeah. um, where I was wonderfully cared for by, um, by actually my wife's parents, who yeah. were kind of my youth leaders. Um, but our youth group was 80. Okay. And the drop-off right. at the end of that, right. you're exactly right, yeah. was significant, Okay. really significant. Okay. The plugging into church was virtually non-existent. So okay. you've just nailed my teenage years. Well, hallelujah for your supernatural well, story. Did, yeah. Okay, the yeah. Lord did a work in you. <laughs> so first of all, it's just a different problem. In a small church, so I, I can name a, um, a church plant in Leeds where I know a family, they left our church to join that church. Their three boys were the only under 18s in the church plant. Right. What did they do? They put each of them into a different home group. None of them were in the same home group as their parents. Oh, right. Every week they were going, they were being offered a meal. They were being treated like adults. They were opening the Bible. They loved it. Those three boys all felt part of the church family. Mm. And um, let's just be really clear, and we're hearing it at this conference, young people need to be listened to. Mm. They do not need hip, cool youth culture offered to them every term. Which is a great relief to me. <laughs> That's good, yeah. yeah, and, yeah. and when you say you love youth yeah. work, I hope yeah. everyone listening is clear. It's not because Adrian is skating around and wears yes. his cap backwards. Yeah, you it's, know just, that. Yeah. it's just because you're yeah. clear. When you ask good questions, they give you great answers. Yeah. Yeah. And there's absolutely a thrill in that. So I, I, I'd say it's harder with, with a small number of children and young people. 
Let's first of all be clear, with under eights, they don't notice that there aren't many of them. Right. With under eights, if there were two children, they'd feel special. Okay, that's helpful to hear. With over eights... So we're thinking, yeah, I've only got two people in my under eights group. Great. Ah! Yeah. They're, they're th thinking, wow, look we at this. We get all the attention. Yeah. Okay. So around about seven or eight, they go from being the only one in the world to suddenly noticing that there is no one yeah. else who's a Christian. Yeah. yeah. So I would say, why don't you start small, young, and the killer stat is 75% of British under fives go along to a church run toddler group. Mm. So I think that's our country's greatest evangelistic yeah, opportunity. Yeah, yeah, definitely. If your church is running a toddler group, please have a strategy for how you're going to get one family to join your church. How are you going to get two families to join your church? It's much easier for a family to join a church when they can bring their children under their arm than when trying to drag a teenagers into church for the first time. Mm. So I would say let's start young. Let's grow our children's and youth work. But if you have those teenagers, they want to be listened to and they want to feel like they're part of a church. Mm. It might not be home group, but it might just be simply talk to them before yeah. and after the service. And, and your home group story is interesting because um, so I, when I first passed at a church, a very, pretty small church, and uh, there were some other children in the church, but not many. So yeah. my children, my two elder girls were pretty much on their own in some ways. Um, but actually, what's, it's just interesting to observe that they develop yeah. intergenerational friendships, yeah. which you get almost nowhere else. Yes. And actually a, a really beautiful, wonderful thing. Yes. Um, and so you suddenly see someone who's 13, slightly awkward 13-year-old. I'm not talking about my own children now, obviously. <laughs> um, but you see a slightly awkward 13-year-old. Yeah talking to a 50 year old yeah. woman yeah. just about life yeah. and stuff and it just you think this is beautiful yeah. this is exactly what it should be at one level yeah yeah and that's something to rejoice in isn't it the, we did a podcast with a single mum called Morena. she tells the story of her to bring her two children to church on a sunday to an fic church she pushed her two children through the door and shouted at them talk to anyone <laughs> that is a picture of church yeah They've had a bad week. They're barely talking to each other. She trusts those in her church enough. I do not mind who you talk to. Someone is going to love you, mm. care for you, listen to you, and maybe even pray with you at the end. And so actually that's another thing that we can do as leaders is encourage our church to see they are all involved in children's ministry if there are children in the church you may be single you may be married yeah. you may have children you may not but actually everyone has a role to play yeah. in nurturing yeah. and discipling yeah. children some people might be set aside to do that right yeah in a, in a more formal way but actually everybody could have that conversation it's um, huge and and look there are there are reasons why it's difficult I, I i find 14 to 18 year olds incredibly intimidating i don't think i ever won't the fact so is, how are you with 54 year olds? <laughs> <laughs> I find them less intimidating. Okay, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad and to hear that. that. But it's because they're very insecure. They fold their arms. They never make eye contact and they never say much. So someone being silent, looking at the floor with their arms crossed is intimidating to mm. me. It takes courage to think, okay, every week I'm going to say hello to that one person. I'm going to find out their name. I'm going to find out what they're expecting this week. I'm going to pray for them during the week. I'm going to check in with them the week after. And that is how friendships are built. Yeah. And everyone always at this point asks a safeguarding question. You're not leaving the building with the individual. No. You're, no. you're talking to them in plain sight in the church. There are no rules against that. Yeah. that so is you can glorious. be over-realized in that kind of uh, uh, in I, that safeguarding I, In world. my experience, yeah. the older you are, the more terrified you are of a safeguarding yeah. issue. Yeah. Yeah. And you, we just need to reassure each other safeguarding is fine with us talking to one another in yeah, church. Yeah, okay. That's really helpful. Let me tell you something else we do that we, we've learned how to do it's in a slightly painful way, but actually it's really blessed us. Again, with not many young people, is um, we, we do a little Bible study with them uh, once a week, but also once a week we drive them 10 miles up the road to another church which has a, lot, which has a larger youth group. And we deposit them, we deposit them. <laughs> we, we share that burden yeah. And um, wonderfully, in that little setting, yeah. um, we actually send them a check every term yeah. because they look after our kids really well. The kids do a kind of informal thing um, on those Friday nights, but they just enjoy being with other yeah. Christians. Yeah. So we, we're not saying, we're not abrogating our responsibility yeah. for it, but we're saying, 
let's invest, well, you know, driving 12 miles up the road and sitting in a coffee shop while they're in the youth group. Yeah. Let's invest yeah, them yeah. knowing other Christians because they often do feel at that age very alone at school, yeah. very isolated. And, and your reflection on that is it's holy blessing. As an eldership, it's not being complicated. No, I mean, I think there are, um, uh, there are challenges about it because yeah. you slightly lose control of what's being taught, yeah. for example. But actually, it's a social thing mainly mm. they go to. Um, I, I think once we started saying, can we give you some money for this? Yeah. Then it changes the nature of the relationship. Okay. We're not just piggybacking on your youth work. Yeah. We're saying we're really appreciating the investment you're putting in our kids. Yeah. We'd like to contribute to it. Yeah. And at that point, it, it feels more of a mutual relationship. Okay. That they're actually asking you questions about well, what do you think about us doing this or what do you think about us doing that. Okay. So we're not just we're not just using a service. Okay. It feels it's not quite a partnership. Don't know overstated. Okay. But it feels a bit more more there's a bit more investment. We trust the church. Great. We know the church, and so there's a bit more investment. Great. I think because of that. Great. But I, I just think there are creative ways, aren't there, to, to, to help out, you know, for example, being invested in summer camps or, yeah. or you know, take, going as a church along to events where kids can mix with others. It doesn't need to be, um, uh, this just just me and these two children and there's no other way out of this. I, I, I think we'd be well served by just asking ourselves a question, what, you know, what, what, what does discipleship look like? I, I hope we're, we're asking that creatively with our adults. Mm. I hope we're asking that creatively with our children and young people. In some, some of the patterns we are in, like let's put them all through a kid's work and let's put them all through a youth work and drop them off the end and hope, fire them off to uni or somewhere and yeah, hope it yeah. goes well. You know, some of these patterns aren't very helpful. So I, I just hope as an eldership, we're, we're just... We're just asking that question about all discipleship in our church. Mm, that's helpful. That's a very helpful challenge. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. Can we just talk very briefly at the end about training? Mm. Um, I, I guess part of the encouragement we want to give to our our leaders mm. is to make sure they're equipped well. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've always found this a real battle. Yeah. We, we have to do some safeguarding training. Yeah. Um, that's a good thing to do. We yeah. don't want to kind of do, we don't want to make that a kind of oh it's a necessary evil. No, it's a good thing to do. Yeah. But that's one Saturday morning, let's say, uh, there are a limited number of Saturday mornings okay. we can get our guys together and okay. pray together and train. Okay. So, so just give me some headlines about right. how we can create a, a, a good culture okay. for developing our leaders, realizing yep. the many burdens that are on them. Uh, I think the first thing is, is um, let's create a culture where firstly it's ministry and secondly, therefore, it's, it's worth people being observed and fed back so let let's tell them we'd love to do it let's tell them what to expect they're not freaked out they don't have to change everything so, so the normal pattern i see in evangelical churches is the bible is getting opened well kids are being loved really well uh the questions we ask them often don't get beyond what happened in the story. Right. And often one person is doing everything and the helpers are just watching. Mm. So I'd say normally if you observe, you first of all want to tell them what's going really well. And I suspect that list I've just given you. Tell them what's going well. Ask them one thing they think they could do better. And if you want, you could tell them one thing you're going to do better and finish with a positive. You know, that classic yeah, feedback yeah, sandwich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But often it's, let's, uh, let's split up into smaller groups. Now, at that point, you'll say, oh, but they're only helpers. The only helpers is a phrase every church has. It shouldn't be allowed. <laughs> What they mean is we're less confident. I've learned quite a few things that I should not be doing this podcast, okay, which I'm, fine. I'm very grateful. Here's fine. another one. Okay, so only helpers. Only definitely helpers, avoid that. Right. And, and in other words, they're more nervous. But you could give them the piece of paper with the four questions on and just say, I'm just going to give you four children. You're going to ask those four questions. Which, so therefore, children listen most when they're talking. So if you split up your group into however many leaders you've got, then more children are talking, more right. are listening right. and learning. Right. Uh, so that they, that at the end, ask a few questions to get beyond what happened. That that's normally the first thing, the best thing we could do to improve it. But that I think a more effective way to train and learn is by being told what you're doing really well and one thing to work on, mm -hmm. rather than put them all in a room on a Saturday morning. 
and give them a whole bunch of things that may be relevant to a few of them. Yeah, yeah. And we'll get forgotten by the time somebody comes around because brain capacity is I think so. Out anyway. I suspect you know yeah. a lot more than me about how people learn and how yeah. people get trained. Mm. But I suspect it's not the most effective way to train people. Mm. And I think sometimes it just becomes a box ticking exercise for the church as a whole. Yes, Sunday school leader training, tick. Yeah. Um, rather than how do we actually... And this is true of all pastoral work, actually, isn't it? How do we help someone excel in the ministry that God has given them? Yeah. Um, actually, person A might be different from person B. They, they might need some of the same stuff. I mean, if I just told you one sad story, we, we ran an online training webinar on this issue. How do we train our teams? Right. And we gave them that simple model of, of, of feed, feedback and coaching. Yeah. And uh, we had a paid employee of a church who said they they have never had feedback on their ministry in the whole time they've been employed in that church. Goodness. So therefore they said, how on earth I feel inadequate to this task. That That is about as sad a story as you can yeah. hear. Yeah. We can be better than that. On that note, we're going to finish. We, oh, don't, we can. We, can't find we a, can be better we, than that. Can you tell me a happy story to finish with Adrian? I can tell you a happy story. Um, my three daughters, I've baptized all three of my daughters which is just the most wonderful, precious thing. Um, I, I think, as, as I look at their lives, each of them very different, each of them um, unique, obviously, and each of their stories is unique. They've grown up in different churches um, uh, because of the big age gap, and I've served in a number of different churches. But in each case, I would say it has been the, the, the influence of children's workers and youth leaders on their lives has been more than significant it's been momentous now who who knows as we look back over our lives why people become christians in in a human sense there's lots of contributory factors but i can see as a parent just the extraordinary enormous value mm -hmm. looking back that the investment people have made in my children has, has delivered and i i think i want to encourage leaders to say to those um parents whose children are older don't stop remembering that. You know, tell tell younger parents that. Tell the youth leaders, the mm. children's workers, mm. just th those kinds of stories, because that's what that's that's the great encouragement, isn't it? That it's worth it. That the investment you're making, and um, the Lord does use it. And there you go. That's my happy story. That that is a better place to finish. There we are. Thank you, Ed, so much for joining us. I really appreciate your wisdom. And um, you can find out more about Faith in Kids by going to their website, which is faithinkids.org. We'll put, O-R-G. We'll put that in the show notes. Thank you so much. This has been Independence. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please do rate and review us. That helps other people find us. And we'll see you again soon.